The area of philosophy in which Platonism remains the central issue is the philosophy of mathematics. The central question here, and perhaps you've wondered about this question yourself, is does mathematics describe independently existing things, numbers and sets, which don't exist in space and time and so are not presented to us in sensory experience, but rather grasp somehow or other through the intellect? That is the Platonic view of mathematics. And in fact, Plato himself regarded mathematics as key to understanding the nature of reality, the way in which it is constituted of abstract entities. That's why it was supposedly written on the gates of his academy. Let no one enter here who has not first studied geometry. According to mathematical Platonism, we don't invent mathematics, but rather discover it. Just as the four largest moons of Jupiter were out there silently circling the planet before Galileo on January 7, 1610, was able to put his homemade telescope to his eye and observe them, so too mathematical objects have always existed their truths to be discovered by us. A competing view to Platonism is known as formalism, according to which mathematics can be thought of as a kind of human invented game, a higher form of chess, where we make up the rules and then play accordingly, deriving the logical results of those rules. According to Platonism, mathematicians are able to prove theorems because those theorems are true. Whereas according to formalism, those theorems are true because mathematicians are able to prove them. So take the following theorem. There is no highest prime number. A prime number is one which can only be divided by itself or by one. So three, for example, is a prime number. Whereas nine is not, since it's divisible by three. We can prove that there is no highest prime number. In fact, Euclid, who was born about 27 years after Plato died, proved it. It's a kind of proof by contradiction. Assume there's a highest prime number, you can then derive a contradiction. According to Platonists, we can prove this theorem because it's true that there is no highest prime number. And we don't have to go through checking all the numbers, which would be impossible, there being an infinity of them, in order to know that we're never gonna to get to the highest prime number. Whereas for formalists, it's true that there is no highest prime number because we can prove it. It follows from the rules that we've invented. One of the major criticisms of mathematical Platonism is that it makes mathematical knowledge appear rather mysterious. How do we, spatiotemporal creatures, using our physical brains here in space-time, interact with these non-spatiotemporal objects, numbers and sets, in such a way as to give us reliable knowledge of them. Some Platonists have tried to answer this objection by contending that there is a part of us, the part that can know truths about non-spatio-temporal abstract entities, that's like them. It's an immaterial, non-spatial, temporal entity which, which we are able to think about these abstract entities. But according to many philosophers, this way of answering this one mystery, how do we gain knowledge of abstract entities, doesn't dispel the mystery, but on the contrary, multiplies mysteries. For not only does it seem just as mysterious how an immaterial mind can interact with abstract entities, but now we also have the additional mystery of trying to explain how this immaterial aspect of our minds interacts with our physical brain. So this is a problem for Platonism, an epistemological problem that is one concerning the possibilities for our knowledge. Formalism, on the other hand, has the great advantage of taking the mystery out of mathematical knowledge. There's nothing mysterious in our making up systems that consist of nothing but rules, most especially the kinds of rules that are known as recursive rules, rules which can we can keep applying to the results that we get from applying those rules. You can go on and infinitely with these recursive rules. So you can see the appeal of formalism. It really seems to take mystery out of our mathematical knowledge. We can say what happened to formalism, this nice non-mysterious theory, by uttering a single name, Kurt Gödel. 
Gödel was a mathematician who, in 1931, published a startling theorem known as the incompleteness theorem. Actually, there are two incompleteness theorems, with the second being a logical consequence of the first, but it's, it's really only the first theorem that's relevant to this question of formalism. When, at the turn of the millennium, Time magazine devoted an issue to the 100 most important thinkers of the last century, Gödel was listed as number 75, along with his best friend Einstein, who was listed as number one. The writer of Gödel's entry in Time magazine was Douglas Hofstadter, who's the author of the wonderful book, Gödel Escher Bach. Here is how Hofstadter dramatically expressed Gödel's contribution. He turned the lens of mathematics on itself and hit upon his famous incompleteness theorems, driving a stake through the heart of formalism. As Hofstadter's description entails, the incompleteness theorem is a mathematical theorem mathematically proved that has meta-mathematical implications. That is implications about the nature of mathematics itself. It's almost as if an artist had painted a picture and in the picture was actually able to reveal the nature of beauty itself and explain to us why it moves us. This really makes Gödel's incompleteness theorem quite unique. It might even be the case, the evidence is merely circumstantial, that Gödel had found his inspiration for the proof by having learned about Platonism in an introductory class in philosophy, which he took when he was an undergraduate at the University of Vienna. He set about trying to actually produce a mathematical theorem that could speak beyond mathematics to the question of what it is that mathematics actually is, what it's doing, whether it's something we discover or something we invent by way of our formal systems. What he proved was that in any formal system of mathematics that is rich enough to express arithmetic, there will be true propositions, propositions that we can actually see are true, but that we won't able to prove within that formal system. We can prove that we can't prove those propositions within that formal system. This consequence, rigorously proved, entails the limitations of our proofs, though not of our mathematical knowledge. Our mathematical knowledge can exceed what we can rigorously prove, and also, certainly if you're a mathematical Platonist, mathematical truth itself can exceed our mathematical knowledge. What the precise then mathematical consequences of Gödel's incompleteness theorems are is still argued among both philosophers and mathematicians. The mathematics itself is clear. Furthermore, the mathematics had a very practical result. In order to prove the limits of formal systems, Gödel had to make the notion of a formal system far more rigorous than it had been, and in this way, his work actually contributed to the development of computers, which run on formal systems, especially as his work was built on by the English logician Alan Turing. But the philosophical implications are still disputed. A philosophical response to a philosophical problem can inspire rigorous results in another field, and yet still escape definitive resolution. Gödel himself hoped for more. He hoped that eventually the metamathematical position of Platonism, to which he was very committed, especially as he got older, would be undeniably subsumed into mathematics itself. He wrote, I am under the impression that after sufficient clarification of the concepts in question, it will be possible to conduct these discussions with mathematical rigor and that the result will then be that the Platonistic view is the only one tenable. His hope is as yet unfulfilled. Platonism remains stubbornly a philosophical thesis, a strong contender among the alternatives, but still there are alternatives.